Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 201 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at carbon. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Welcome back, everybody, to season 11 of the podcast. We hit 200 episodes last season, which I still can't believe, and we're still going. Thanks to everyone who listens, subscribes, or supports the podcast via Patreon or coffee.com. You are all lifesavers. This season, from a sponsorship point of view, we have, as usual, marquee sponsors. And following on from last season, we also have a number of episode sponsors. Our marquee sponsor continues to be ZapMap, for whom we are eternally grateful. But you'll also hear episodes sponsored by a number of different organisations across the season. Not many, about one in five. You may also see a few subtle but important changes to the podcast, and I want to talk about them here. This season, and hopefully all subsequent seasons, will have a little more of a focus on the renewables aspect of a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. The format will change slightly this season in that there will be a new segment included in the podcast, which will be Carbon Literacy Fact of the Week. This is where you'll learn something that you may or may not know about renewables and your carbon footprint. More on that a little later. This season is also going to be very much focused on education as an aspect of EV ownership. Hopefully we'll be doing an episode where we speak with dealers about the education going on there. We'll also be talking with EVA England about the education they're providing, especially to people like MPs and those tasked with putting a political strategy for electric vehicles together. The end of season roundtable should also be interesting because I'm planning on, uh, well, I don't want to jinx it, but I will hopefully be presenting something that nobody has done before, at least for me. Our main topic of discussion today is carbon. All the talk of climate change can basically be narrowed down to two different aspects. The pollution caused by burning fossil fuels, particulate matter especially, and the release of greenhouse gases into the air. But inside that latter aspect is a whole different world of situations. Many people intuitively know that we're a carbon-based life form on a carbon-based planet. But outside that, the whole aspect of carbon literacy is something that not many people understand in a great deal of detail. So today I want to talk about carbon literacy. What is it? Why do we need it? What could it mean for us? More importantly, how quickly do we need to act? We have to act now. There isn't time to wait. When people think that it's 2050, it's really not. It's now. We have to peak emissions by 2025. We have to half them by 2030. So just think, how are you going to half your emissions by 2030? That's really the critical question. That sounds stealthy. I run Leaders Sustainability, which is a a sustainability consultancy that I set up um, at the end of 2022. And basically, a lot of what I do is carbon literacy project training. So we need to move and we need to move quickly. How? And that's what carbon literacy project training helps people with. In a day, you learn about what's going to make an impact. You think about what in your life you could change. And I think you do really realize why why we need to act now. That's what I love about it. It makes people understand so much more. It made me understand. Uh, That's why I'm doing this now. Of course, the underlying aspect of this that is quite important is the belief that climate change is something that is man-made and we have some sort of an impact over that. So how do we know this is true? I mean, the climate scientists, if you go and look at the climate science, I was actually listening to um, a video the other night because I sometimes go back and double check this and think, are we absolutely certain Yes, we are. You look at the graphs from 1950 onwards, which is when transport has increased, just the linkage in terms of the temperature rises over that period 
the science shows how the greenhouse gases um, are basically acting as a blanket around the air. So the more carbon that we put into the atmosphere and carbon dioxide equivalents, I mean, carbon dioxide is the main one, but there are other greenhouse gases. The more that we put into the atmosphere, the more climate change increases. So we are basically building up to a level where we just cannot put any more into the atmosphere because it, they are reflecting the, the radiation of the sun backwards and forwards. At the time of writing, the carbon levels are around 490 parts per million. In the big scheme of things, that's 0.049%, which seems to be tiny. But even tiny amounts such as that have a huge impact when you consider the rate of change. We'll talk more about this in a later episode this season when we speak with a genuine climate scientist. And we'll cover lots of different aspects of climate change, carbon levels, Arctic warming, weather events, and all sorts. So let's move quickly on and talk about carbon footprint. Carbon footprints were a marketing scheme devised on behalf of BP back in the early part of the 20th century. The subliminal aim was to put the emphasis on the individual to manage how much carbon they're responsible for, rather than keeping the focus on the big polluters like Shell, Saudi Aramco, and, oh, BP themselves. But as a shorthand for discussing the things that we need to focus on now, it's quite a good one. Most people say they want to do the best for the planet by reducing their carbon footprints. But what are the things that they think are good that they're doing, but which are actually meaningless? I think the one that everybody thinks of is recycling and swapping their light bulbs. And I mean, it's not meaningless. Um, it does have an impact and certainly, you know, there is a great big dustbin of, in the in the Pacific Ocean, which is the size of Texas, or I think it's even double the size of Texas, um, which is just a plastic mountain. And and yeah, you know, we we need to solve that problem too. But I kind of I suppose I think if we're unable to make food, if we're unable to grow food, our population is increasing towards ten billion by twenty fifty. There are bigger things. I mean, in my mind, I. It's funny, I'll probably get shot down for that by all sorts of environmentalists. But I kind of go, if we haven't got a planet, does it matter whether or not it's covered in plastic? You know, if we haven't got humanity anymore because we've uh, had so many wars over water shortages or food shortages or whatever, those to me seem like the biggest things to tackle. I know when I talk with some people about carbon footprints and reducing your impact on the environment, there's always that one person who says, yes, but even if I reduce my footprint to zero, it makes no difference if China is opening a new coal mine every day. How would you reply if I said that to you? Ooh, ooh, Gary, Gary, you haven't been reading your Chinese news. You really haven't. I mean, have you seen how much they're increasing in solar and wind energy? And yeah, I mean, they might be putting in plans to open more coal-powered factories and things like that. But whether they will actually get into use or not is really debatable. China is leading the world in everything green at the moment. They have they're, they're responsible for half of all well, half of all the world's EVs, and they are doubling wind and solar. And um, just in a year. Hopefully they will peak emissions by, um, I think it's about 26, whereas it was due to be 2030. So they are bringing everything forwards because they realize the urgency of this. And it is Chinese people, people around the equator who are going to be most impacted. And that really is the unfair piece as well. You know, we've had hundreds of years of industrial revolution. We've grown to the place that we are putting all this nasty stuff up into the atmosphere. But it's not actually us that's probably going to suffer the worst impacts. It's the people around the equator and the people who are least able to afford it. I would also say, you know, those Chinese factories, what are they making? Uh, you know, they're, they're building up their industry in order to support the rest of the world. So we have some responsibility about what we buy and where we get it from as well and how far it's come around the world. Um, and yes, you know, population is tricky. I don't know that anyone would say that there's much that we can do about population growth, but really the resources of the the world are going to be under severe strain just from going from the sort of 9 billion to 10 billion that we're expecting to do within 25 years. Yeah, it's massive if you think about that. Um, I mean, so one thing I know from Carbon Literacy Project training, um, look, they've looked at basically what they think the migration patterns might be 
um, by 2050. And it could be a billion people trying to move around the planet to move to places that are more livable. Um, if you compare that with the Syria and um, the Syrian refugees a few years ago, that was about a million, um, three million tops altogether, a million trying to get into Europe. So we're talking about a thousand times that level if we don't get this sorted. China does, of course, have a large carbon footprint and a chunk of that is from producing the goods that we use in the Western world. But it's not all that. China is going through an unprecedented growth spurt at the moment, and this growth spurt uses millions of tonnes of steel and concrete, both of which are key sources of greenhouse gas. So how much of a problem are we actually talking about? What are the sort of percentages of greenhouse gas emissions by various sectors? Interestingly, when I came into this, I knew transport was bad, but I didn't in my head think that it was that bad. And I mean, in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, transport is actually in the UK, it, it, it's 34% of domestic emissions, 34%. Um, so it's by far the biggest sector. I mean, if you take other greenhouse gases into, impact, into effect on top, you know, like methane, et cetera, then that drops a little bit, but still over a quarter of total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and again, you know, bigger than energy, bigger, bigger than business, bigger than residential. Um, a lot bigger than agriculture. So it is the sector that we need to reduce. And unfortunately, it's the sector that's increasing. You know, we are looking at potentially doubling traffic within the next 25 years. And so it's only going to get worse. And yes, you know, I am a big supporter of moving to electric vehicles, but we also need to move to public transport. We also need to reduce journeys overall. And there are so many things that we should be doing instead. We should be walking and cycling more. And then you know, if people have to use a car, then please use an electric vehicle if you possibly can. Make sure that it's charged by renewable energy if you can. You know, It's almost every stage of the journey. Think what you can do. And in terms of you know, public transport, the buses and the trains will be going anyway. So the more people you can get on them, the better they are in terms of emissions because that Every extra person basically reduces the emissions of those vehicles. And they're, they're moving to electric as well. You know, there's lots of electric buses now coming out, which is brilliant. Um, so uh, we need to do this. We need to do it over the next five, 10 years. Um, and things like reserve mandate will help. Um, you know, things like leasing models will help with electric vehicles swap over. Things like their businesses moving faster to EVs for their fleets. That will also help too, um, because then that will hopefully feed into the secondhand market. But I would say it, it would be good if people started doing active travel. It's healthier for them too, you know. It's better for the NHS if people are walking and fit rather than just jumping in a car, which is just outside their door. So um, I really would urge listeners, if they can, think about the journeys that you're doing. And if you're going by car, you know, car share if you can. It's much more fun, much more social. Um, and again, you'll be halving your emissions for every extra person you, you have in your car. If we stay with reducing our impact, things like coffee and chocolate have high carbon footprints, so we should cut those out. We should sell our cars, not fly abroad. If I was to play devil's advocate, if I was to play devil's advocate, I would say this is just going to make people miserable. Is that really the right way? Oh, gosh, that's quite a statement that it makes them miserable. As I say, you know, I've had lots of benefits from actually living a lower carbon life. I have to say, I still, I still eat coffee and I still eat chocolate. So I think everyone just has to think about what in their lives they're happy to change and try things. You know, I mean, over the last year, yes, yeah, all right, I gave up my car, car fairly quickly. That was a reasonably easy choice for me because I work remotely, so I didn't need it. I mean, my children um, are both adults, so they've sort of left home as well. It was something that I could do really easily. For other people, they won't be able to do that. But I mean, if you're a mum with children that go to a club, car share, you know, apart from running else every other week, it means that you'll have some time off because somebody else will be taking your children to the clubs. And you'll be saving half the jet, half the emissions there, you know. So I think we should be careful about thinking that everything that you might do for climate change is going to be negative. I would far rather look at all the positives of, you know, 
just imagine a world where it's all electric vehicles. It's going to be quiet and clean and people aren't going to have asthma problems and you know, they're going to live longer. I, you know, so, and, and they're maybe going to be fitter and healthier because they'll walk for a train or a bus or whatever. We'll maybe be more social because we'll be talking to people more. So there are an awful lot of positive things around this too. And I think people, particularly those that don't want to change, are too quick to look at the negatives. As you mentioned, uh, you famously, well, famously amongst people who know you, sold your car last year. How was that going for you? Was it worth the sacrifice? Yeah. I mean, it's actually been a lot easier than I expected it to be. I thought that it would be a lot harder. And in fact, in many ways, many journeys are nicer and other journeys are more fun because you actually have to think about how you're going to get to a place. My parents live in Scotland. And if I'm honest, that would have been, that is the, the big journey that I was worrying about most. I was thinking, how am I going to get up to Scotland? I got on the train. I take my dog on the train. And actually, you know, when I used to drive, I used to get a really bad back because it was such a long journey. Um, I really don't think it was that good for me. I would quite often get back from that, that trip to Scotland and I would have to go and lie down for the next few days, worry about whether my back had gone. On a train, you can move around. The dog is incredibly social. So I have conversations with people. I had a great conversation with a PhD Chinese student, having just talked about China, and asked him about you know, how the government there tells everyone about climate change. And he said, they don't. They just make it cheaper. I thought, what a fabulous answer. You know, they make it cheaper to go by electric vehicle or public transport. They make it cheaper to have renewable energy than to use fossil fuels. And it, you know, people are motivated by price. So I just hope that, yes, the cheaper Chinese vehicles come over here and the smaller, cheaper vehicles that you know, are competitive against ICE vehicles and people start using them because that would ha have a tremendous impact. So in terms of things that I hope manufacturers will do, I hope they will move to smaller vehicles that are less intensive on resources. I hope that they will move to smaller ones. I mean, yeah, do you like me? You know, if you need a bigger car for the holidays, hire one, you know. And you'll find it so much cheaper. That's the other thing. I mean, I'm saving several thousand pounds a year by not having a car. And that's even with the public transport costs on top. I don't think people will realize quite how much you're spending on a car when you have one. And I know um, I'm lucky. I, you know, I live a 10 minute walk from town, a 10 minute walk from the station, which does go up to London. It's not the best train service in the world, but it's okay. Buses are appalling, but never mind. And when I want to cycle, you know, I can take my little dog, he is small, thank God, on the back of my bike in a pannier. So I, I take him along in that as well. So I've learned all sorts of things, you know, different ways to travel, different apps to use. I really enjoyed it. And I've got to know my local area better. I miss the seaside, I must admit. I miss the seaside, but my parents live by the sea. So when I go up there, I just make the most of it. I've mentioned it a couple of times on this episode already, but a lot of this season is going to be education focused. You provide carbon literacy education, Anne. In fact, I took one of your courses before Christmas and loved it. Now, talk to me about the work that you're doing with the carbon literacy training and how that operates. I love CLP. It's what made me act. It's what made me get off my backside and actually do this. <laughs> because as I say, you know, I've been kind of keen on it for a few years and thought that I needed to do something. And um, so first of all, my daughter did say to me, I kept saying to her, what do you, you and Tommy are going to have to sort out climate change? And she said, well, what are you doing about it, mum? You're not exactly past it. So I thought, okay, that's point number one. And point number two was that when I did the course myself, so I did the online course, first of all, um, which is more detailed. Um, it has an awful lot of information, but I quite like doing courses like that. It just really hit me. We, we have to act now. You look at the graphs and you see them going off the scale, you know, the climate scientists were saying that you know, the weather last year, the summer, it was the hottest ever. 2023 was the hottest ever in the world. Um, I mean, okay, in the UK, we had hotter the year before when we had over 40 degrees. We should not be getting those sorts of temperatures. And when you look at the graphs, sea temperatures, ice melt around Antarctica and the Arctic, the weather, you know, the storms, has nobody noticed that the rain is getting heavier? So what carbon literacy does is it just brings it all together in one day of training. It covers about eight different areas. So it's quite a full on day. 
I think you'll probably agree. It tells you about the science. It tells you about the inequity of it. It tells you about your carbon footprint and, and leaves you really to work out what do you want to do. And yeah, you don't have to give up your car like me. That just happened to be something that I could do. And I must admit, I only did that after I did the sort of second part of the course, which is where you meet with other people and, and you do your pledges. So part of carbon literacy is about doing this in a group so that you get that sort of combined learning. And that's another thing that I really love about it. You know, I get groups of people and many of them are very, very educated in their particular field and transport. A lot of them you know, are people that are in the sustainability world, the climate change world, you know, one way or another, a lot of them are from the EV industry. And they just come out of it going, I need to do something now. And the pledges that people make, they are, you know, the best thing almost about the course. Yes, I love doing it. Yes, I love giving it. Yes, I love the interactions. And the fact that I learn to virtually every course, you know, I will learn something as well. But they come out of it and they go, I'm not going to fly for the next two years. I'm not taking my children away on holiday because I'm going to take out my, I'm going to use the money to take out my gas boiler instead. And to have that sort of impact in one day to me is incredible. And all right, that might put people off coming on the course, but I hope not because it just shows the strength of feeling of people once they've come on that course and found out what we need to do, we have to do. So how often do these courses run? Yeah, at the moment, I'm running them once a month. That's really just because that's quite a nice time scale. I do do other work as well. So um, I just have those in the diary. If anybody wants me to do a special course and I do that on top, I'm doing, I'm running three courses for um, a company. Uh, I've not mentioned who, but it is a, a in, in the major industry um, over the next couple of months. So I'm doing some of that too. And I mean, if I have more demand than I can cater for, I will put in more because I do love doing it. And really, uh, it is just a case of spreading the word. And thank you very much for helping to do that through this. You're very welcome. Uh, my follow on question for you is, you know, if there's a large company listing, and I know I have a number of CEOs who regularly listen to this podcast, how would they go about booking training with you for their staff? What sort of class size would they need and, and frequency, that sort of thing? Um, so the courses I do are online at the moment. I mean, I can do face-to-face. -face. Part of the, the pledge process is that each individual needs to make a pledge and that is more manageable in smaller groups, obviously online. Um, the other thing that because of the sort of group interactions, I tend to do 15, 18 people maximum. Um, because that allows everybody to participate. It allows everybody time to feedback from their groups as well. And to be honest, it's quite a long day and quite an intensive day as it is. So obviously, the more groups that you have, then the more people you have feeding back. I sometimes split it into two days, which makes it easier to half days. Um, so that's what I'm doing for this company that I'm, I'm training over the next few weeks. So really, just if they're interested, get in touch with me through the website, leadwithsustainability.co.uk. Um, I'm sure that you'll put the details up, hopefully, about where to find that too. So just come through to me, add me on LinkedIn and direct message me, whatever. I'd love to hear from you. The courses themselves are run over teams or equivalent and involve a group of people doing interactive sessions, learning and group breakouts. I think when I did it, there were 12 people on the course, so we could break out into three groups of four when required. Now, it can be a long day. I think it's around eight hours in total. But if uh, required, these can be split into two half-day sessions. One of the things participants will need to do as part of the course is to commit to a pledge. This can be as simple as cutting down on meat or a little more involved. I mean, when I say about the pledges, they're actually called evidence. So it's more about what are you going to do? The evidence is that you've learned about climate change and make a difference. They used to be called pledges. And yes, you are effectively saying that you will do this. Um, so some is around, uh, quite a lot of is around travel, but I guess that's relatively unsurprising given that I'm running a transport and automotive sector and um, training piece. Um, some people choose to move to public transport or set up car sharing schemes and things like that around their, their company. So 
Some also go and do things like community activities. So I think quite a lot of people come on the course and then think, oh, that would be a good way of, of spreading, spreading the word about climate change as well. Uh, a lot of people do come on and go, right, I'm going to tell other people about the course, which is always nice. Quite a few around. Uh, so I had one chap in September, I remember, who um, is going on holiday to Croatia this summer and he's going by train now, <laughs> which I think will be interesting. So, um, so he's doing that. Quite a few people sort of saying that they'll move to an electric vehicle more quickly um, as well once they've realized the benefits of doing that. So just a vast array, really. And, and that's the nice thing about the course. It gives you a lot of different options for things that you can do. And I think the motivation out of the course, it gives you, you know, that thirst for learning more. So you sort of develop that as it goes along. Emma did have one CEO as well who said that um, she was going to change the manufacturing of her company to make the the, the whole business uh, more electric as well. So some of them are amazing. You know, some of the pledges are uh, are just incredible. I've had yeah editors of magazines and things who I've seen afterwards post a lot more on LinkedIn, change their business as well to be more sustainable. So it's really what suits you. These pledges or evidences actually cover two aspects. There's the personal aspect related to what you're going to do on an, uh, an individual level. Then there's the professional aspect related to what you're going to do in your workplace. Obviously, the effectiveness of these things relate to your level. The story Anne just told of the CEO who was going to change the whole company's manufacturing process to electric is one example. My pledge this year was to promote this aspect of carbon literacy on the podcast and to provide training and awareness. Anne's presence here on this episode is the start of that. And she'll be back shortly to fulfil more of my pledge. So to wrap up, here's a couple of takeaways from this discussion. It goes without saying that climate change is an urgent issue that requires immediate action. The transport sector is a major contributor to carbon emissions and needs to be addressed. Electric vehicles, or even giving up your car and moving to public or active transport, is a great solution where possible. Anne has done it, and even though it wasn't seamless, she's enjoying doing it, and her bank balance is far better off as a result. Individuals can make a significant impact by reducing their carbon footprint through sustainable choices. It's not just single-use plastics, though. You need a full awareness of what you're doing and what impact that has on your footprint. And provides carbon literacy trading, which is an effective way to raise awareness and inspire action. Links to Anne's website are in the show notes. If you can take the course she provides, I wholeheartedly recommend it. If you work for a company that might like a group of people to take the course, get in contact with her and she'll be more than happy to set a course up for you. Many thanks to Anne for her time. Each episode this season, I'm going to provide a carbon literacy fact, something to make you go, oh, I didn't realise that. Now, I've asked Anne if she will read these out for me, and she's kindly agreed to do so. So here's this episode's carbon literacy fact of the week then. Did you know transport is the largest emitting sector in the UK? More than a third of carbon dioxide emissions are caused by transport, with over 90% of that due to travelling by road. And unlike most sectors, transport is increasing. That's why we need to cut journeys and swap to more sustainable transport now. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. In keeping with the carbon theme of this episode, British band Coldplay created a carbon neutral tour. Their Music of the Sphere store was designed to be as low carbon as possible. To achieve this, the band put in place numerous initiatives and tech. They installed kinetic floors and stationary cycles so the fans could generate electricity to power the performance. They moved to battery power and hydro-treated vegetable oil to power lights and their trucks. They used recyclable materials and second life materials to create the set. They ensured venues had plant-based and meat-free food options, water fountains and minimal single-use plastics. They encouraged fans to arrive via public transport by offering discounts to those that did. They recycled waste and composted food waste, and all their merchandise was ethically and sustainably sourced. Obviously, they still had a carbon footprint after all that, 
but the most recent sustainability report showed that they produce 47% less carbon dioxide equivalent emissions than their last stadium tour 2016 to 2017. I posted on social media recently whether it might be worth producing carbon accounting reports for all sorts of events, uh, COP meetings, for example, the Super Bowl, the CES event in Las Vegas. Not as a means of shaming people or pointing the figure, pointing the finger, but more as a way of informing people to allow them to make potentially a different decision in future about attending an event such as this or changing the way they travel to an event. What are your thoughts? The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps that EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use with subscription plans for enhanced features such as using ZapMap in car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at Musings EV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've gone electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've gone renewable. It is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Or why not let me know you got to this point by tweeting me at Musing CV with the words carbon footprints, hashtag if you know you know nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know he bet me £10 I couldn't tell him who the new ruling party in Hong Kong was. I said, it's still not Chris Patton. And he said, oh, oh, Gary, Gary, you haven't been reading your Chinese news. You really haven't. That's another one for the older listeners there. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.